Hello? Hi, I'm Donna Brandis. I'm from the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. And I'm Susan Mastin from the Yurok Tribe in Northern California, the largest tribe in the state, along the Klamath River. I am the founder and co-president of Women Empowering Women for Indigenous Nations. And today it's my honor and privilege to introduce our next candidate for the presidency. But first I just want to say we had an opportunity to have a discussion with him earlier. And I'm really pleased to hear that he is very interested in and concerned about um, our resources and that um, he is uh, promising to follow up um, closely on our issues. So I'm looking forward to uh, spending more time with him as he moves through this candidacy. It's my honor to introduce to you Tom Steyer. Thank you very much. So as much as possible, I'd like to take questions and have a conversation with the panel, so I'll try and keep this as short as possible, I would like to talk a little bit about why I'm running for president. Um, look, I'm running for this very simple reason, which is I believe that the government is broken. I believe that it's been bought by corporations, and I don't think we're going to get any of the progressive policy um, initiatives that I think everybody in the United States wants, certainly every Democrat wants, things like affordable health care as a right for every single American quality public education from pre-K through college as a right for every single American. Clean air and clean water as a right. No one gets to poison you for money. And a living wage, the idea that one job should be enough to support a family. There has been a 40-year war against working people, against organized labor, against the rights of most Americans. A living wage is a right. We aren't going to get that until we take back the government. And I have spent the last 10 years as an activist, as an outsider, putting together coalitions of Americans, normal American citizens like the people here, to beat that unchecked corporate power. And I've done it against oil companies in terms of clean energy in California and outside California, but including in Nevada. In 2018, Question six, 50% clean energy by 2030. We pushed that, it won. I've done it against tobacco companies, $2 pack cigarette tax, three to $4 billion a year, gave the money to Medi-Cal healthcare for the lowest income Californians. But I've also built one of the largest grassroots organizations in the United States, Next Gen America. We've been in Nevada since 2013. <laughs> We're on 10 campuses in 2018. And NextGen did the largest youth voter mobilization in American history that year, including right here. I also, NextGen has a partnership with seven national labor unions that have knocked on doors in the last two election cycles. In 2018, that organization, For Our Future, knocked on 500,000 doors in Nevada and had tens of thousands of conversations. And when, in fact, Nevada flipped in 2018 to a blue state with a Democratic state Senate, a Democratic state legislature, and a Democratic government, governor, all kinds of good things happened here. And we had worked really hard in this state along with everybody else here. But specifically, I want to cite some of the changes here. Assembly Bill 137 to prevent voter disenfranchisement on tribal lands. Assembly Bill 264, strengthen sovereignty rights within tribal jurisdictions. When we are, are successful at the grassroots, the good things that people want happen. Nevada is a perfect example. We have worked specifically here with Battleborn Future at NextGen. And, it for, with for, and it for our future. And we are working right now to create an intertribal agency to strengthen sovereignty right to coordinate native engagement in elections. For the first time, we're putting up the money to make that happen, but it's something that should have happened a long time ago. The last thing I'll say is this. I've been doing this. I'm an outsider. 
Everybody else who's running for president, if you look at those people on that stage yesterday, everybody's a career politician. I really want to change Washington, D.C. I'm for term limits, 12 years, Congress people and senators. If you, and Nevada is a perfect example. If you want real change, you have to put new and different people in charge. In Nevada, with term limits, when it flipped, Nevada now has the only state legislature in the country that's more than 50% women. We need new and different people in charge. I want to say one other thing. I'm the only person in this race who will say that climate's my number one priority. I have been working on this for more than 12 years. I helped to block the Keystone Pipeline. I helped to block the last fossil fuel plant in Oxnard, the Puente plant that I hope is ever proposed in California. And every single thing I've done in terms of climate, environment, clean energy has been based, started with environmental justice. I start with the communities where it's not safe to breathe because you'll get sick and get asthma and you can't drink the water that comes out of the tap safely. So everything I do, my climate plan is called a justice-based climate plan. I start with environmental justice. And let me say this. When I was working on to stop Keystone, I went up to Canada to see what it looked like up there around the tar sands. And I was staying with the local First Nations chief. I was staying in his house, and he told me, he, he was a, probably a 45-year-old guy, he probably had access to half a lawyer, and he was fighting international oil companies that had dozens of lawyers. And he wasn't, he'd been doing it for a long time and he hadn't been doing well. And the guy who led the lawyers for the oil companies retired, and he'd been beating up on these First Nations people for decades. Retired on a Friday, called him on a Monday and said, Chief, don't ever stop fighting. You're the only thing between your tribe and extinction. That is what I think about environmental justice. That is why it's at the center of what I do. If we get the justice part right about climate and the environment, we'll get everything else right. And that's exactly my attitude, and that's exactly the people that I start with, not the people who I fit in at the end. And I want to say one last thing specifically. Look, I'm in favor of these progressive I'm in favor of the rights of American citizens that I was talking earlier about, health care. And I specifically want to talk, I can talk about them in terms of rural America and the absolute right we have a whole rural plan to redevelop that would be very relevant for Native Americans. But I want to say something else. I am someone who believes that policy comes out of narrative. And I believe it's absolutely critical in terms of the policies in Indian country that we tell the, sto the true story of the last 500 years. And there's no way to describe it without including the words, native genocide. So when I think about the context of these, of these choices, and I think about we're going to talk about a bunch of policies and what needs to be done, it's really important to remember, in my opinion, policy comes out of narrative. And this, you know, there'll be some specific questions, but if you, I have, this is a topic which I have studied for my entire life and is one that I have strong feelings about. And I think for us to get the policy right, it's necessary to tell the true story of the last 500 years. And it's a terrible story. And it, the only way we'll change things is by accepting what's happened and understanding we have to do so much better. We have to make an entire break with a terrible past. Thank you, thank you. Um, one thing I want to talk about before we start with the panel 
is the fact that, you know, I talked earlier, we've come a long way from smoke signals, and honestly, the, the uh, live streams and everything were great. We were able to get our message out. But I, I, I want you to show your love for Mr. Steyer, who is here in person to talk to you. <laughs> And one more thing, when you were talking about Nevada, uh, Tom, is in 2014, the young lady you're sitting next to there and the, the tribes in, in, in uh, Nevada, Pyramid Lake, Walker River, they went, and prior to that democratic blue change in Nevada, they started fighting for voting rights. They got early satellite offices. They, they were the ones pushing Nevada and the citizens in Nevada saying, if we, as a minority of nation or minority of people, but still nations can fight, you can do it. And and you saw the numbers go throughout all Nevada on that day. So thank you. Now, I want to start now, uh, Councilman uh, Pollock. You want to start, and we'll just kind of go down the line. Thank you, OG. Tom. Uh, I'm so much more comfortable calling you Tom than Mr. Steyer. Good. Okay. <laughs> That's what everybody calls me. <laughs> All right. In October last year, we had the first uh, MMIW Tribunal held in Browning, Montana. It was hosted by the Blackfeet Tribe. Uh, at that time, a letter from you had been written to Mr. Rain Bear Stands last, who is the Executive Director of Global Indigenous Council and Chairman uh, Timothy Davis of the Blackfeet Tribe. And uh, one of the paragraphs that I would like to quote from that came out of the letter, would you mind handing that down to him? Tragically, Native women suffer from violent and sexual crimes at higher rates than non-Native women. In addition to this horrific reality, the number of cataloged MMIWG is lower due to underreporting and, in, and inadequate data collection. As a country, we must prioritize policies that protect and advance women. We must believe them when they are assaulted and investigate when they go missing. Tom, what, what would those policy priorities be? And would those priorities include supporting the Reduce, Return, and Recover Act that is spoken about in Somebody's Daughter that Congressman John Lewis has committed to introduce based on policy proposals from indigenous organizations and tribes on the front lines of the MMIW tragedy. So yes, of course, it would support that specifically. I think this is a tragic epidemic that requires focus, money, and whatever it will take to end it and make sure that we're on top of it. You know, I think everybody should recognize the, the, number, the thousands of women who are missing mm -hmm. and that there has been Native women are subject to violence at rates that are twice non-Native women. It is completely unacceptable. It is an absolute example of when government needs to focus and act and do whatever it can to push back, and I guarantee I would. Thank you, Tom. As, uh, if I may, uh, just as a follow-up, it, it, um, it is epidemic across the country. Uh, just recently in Montana, there, there is another young lady went missing, um, Selena Not Afraid. And I was visiting with a gentleman from Alaska who's uh, informed me of another one that was mur just murdered in Fairbanks recently. So it, it is something that, it, it's sad that uh, the federal government uh, makes these promises. It's great that they have put an MMIW task force together. Uh, we have been promised by the U.S. Attorney that, uh, that more FBI agents will be moved uh, towards the Blackfeet Reservation in particular, but uh, that hasn't come to fruition yet, and it's because of the uh, missing murdered people cold cases. So thank you, Tom. Um, I hope you make president. 
And I think that you're a good man, and, and I think that you'll be good to your word. Look, Mark, what we've seen is that services, including health care, including education, and including protection, are distributed very, very unequally in our society. And there's no way to look at that without observing a, a racial bias and a, preju a prejudice against pe different peoples of color. And there's no way to look at this and not understand that we have to go above board in terms of focus and attention to overcome that systematic racism and prejudice that has been around forever. Tom, uh, echoing OJ, thank you for taking the time to come see us. Uh, we're a very small part of the population, less than 2 percent. But in 2020, when you look at a number of the states, Michigan, Wisconsin, Nevada, and Arizona, the population of the native vote matters. And it can change the dynamics here. And I think you recognize that and being here is really important. We have a separation of powers issue in, in, in the United States. And our Constitution lays out what the legislature is supposed to do, what the executive branch is supposed to do, and the judiciary. Legislative branch is going to take, you know, talks about funding. You know, they're going to be the folks that appropriate the money. It's the executive branch, though, that, that is tasked with developing a budget and then working and implementing that budget. When you're president and you're in the White House, Indian country benefits or is serviced by numerous programs that span a number of different agencies. How will your administration navigate that and be able to coordinate all those efforts that are in education, that are in labor, that are in interior, small business administration? How will you, your administration coordinate that in a much more valuable way for Indian country? Well, I think the first thing to say is this. There's got to be so someone within the White House whose job is coordination, who is, has access to the president, and so has act, and everyone has access to him or her. Because what we're talking about, look, let's face it, India, the Indian Affairs Office has a terrible history of inefficiency and corruption. And it's absolutely critical that in overseeing all of these agencies, that there be someone with power to deal to actually pull things together in the White House, but in addition, someone to whom Native Americans around the country have access to so that in fact it's a partnership. And so everything that I understand about organizing things is somebody has to be in control, but they have to work in partnership with the people who know the most and who are on the ground. So it's got to be someone really from Indian country, who has a history, who has relationships, and who can make sure that the federal agencies are working in tandem and efficiently, but has access to the president and has relationships around the country with people like you to make sure that when there are problems, when there are huge issues like the safety of Native women, that in fact the resources, the people, the attention is spent immediately and effectively. Look, this is a question about priorities. I keep saying to everybody, this is, when you look at government, it's not a question of whether you care, it's a question of whether you care enough and in the right order. And this is something that is very close to my heart. And just for the record, I thought the question was more important than who I am. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm Kevin Allis. I'm Chief Executive Officer of the National Congress of American Indians, and I'm an enrolled member of the Forest County Potawatomi community in northern Wisconsin. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Kevin. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lance Gums. I am currently the Vice Chairman of the Shinnecock Nation in New York. I'm also the alternate regional vice president for the National Congress for the Northeast, which stems from Maine to DC. Uh, and first, for, first and foremost, I always, when I'm in another tribal area, I acknowledge those tribes that are in that area. And so I would just like to thank the Nevada tribes for allowing us to be here and to uh, be a part of this event. Um, Tom, there's a, there's a very serious issue. I've been here for two days and I've heard very little 
talked about um, another serious issue that is affecting uh, a lot of tribes in this country. Um, it's called the Cartieri issue. And the Cartieri issue started in uh, Rhode Island. Uh, it had to do with the tribe, the Narragansett Indian tribe, that wanted to take um, 30 something, 34 acres into trust for housing. Right. Um, the governor at that time accused them of trying to do uh, gaming on that land after they already had all of these housing units started, the foundations, the frames up, uh, and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court back, came back and said, and it was a disastrous decision, that they said that um, the issue now pertained to whether tribes had the right to take land into trust or whether it was in 1934. Well, they came back with a decision that said now. That now meant 1934. So basically, any tribe that um, is recognized or has been recognized after 1934 that wasn't congressionally recognized or in the case of the Virginia tribes recently where the president just signed off, now does not have the ability to take land into trust. And the detriment to that is now it's created two classes of tribes in the country. It's created a class of tribes that has the ability to take land into trust and to be able to do economic development you know, in their communities. And those tribes like mine, who was recognized in uh, 2010 after a 32 year legal fight, we cannot take land into trust now or be able to provide for our people economically because of this situation. It's a very critical situation and I'd like to know, it's 10 years now, it's, this happened in 2009, here we are now um, going into 2020 and it still has not been rectified. So what do you see you know, as a solution to this problem? Well, I do understand this problem. I do understand that it creates two classes of tribes. I do understand that it's preventing economic development for people who absolutely desperately need economic development. So I'm 100% on your side. I think this is a question of where we're going to have to pass a new law specifically saying that every tribe is in the same position and can take land into trust. And I don't think there's any question about it. I don't think it's a close call. And I think it's the kind of thing that we've got to push on. Look. I read a book about the 20 worst decisions of the Supreme Court. And over the last 200 plus years, they've had some real Lulus. And let me say an awful lot of their worst decisions had to do with racism against somebody. And to me, this is a straight up issue. This is, should be changed. It's, it's straightforward how to do it. It's gonna have to be through congressional action. And I will push hard for it. Thank you for that. Puju Anin and Nishnabe Duke, Mino Gijigad Ngum, Mandaman and Dijnakaz, Melanie Benjamin Indigo. I'm Melanie Benjamin, and I am the tribal chairperson for the Mille Band of Ojibwe in East Central Minnesota. And um, thank you for being here today, and thank you to everyone out in the audience as well, and others that are uh, viewing this important conversation that we're having today. And um, while we were in the back, we had the opportunity to visit a little bit. So we do have some connections. And um, used to have your cabin up north in northern Minnesota and fish uh, around Walker. And so that's in the area of the Leech Lake a Band of Ojibwe. Yeah. So I just wanted to recognize that. And um, I think that's, so you know where I'm coming from. I've been to Leech Lake. Yeah. So uh, my issue is really uh, reservation boundaries. And for the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, our reservation was established in 1855. And because of a lot of disagreements, land steals, um, back in the day in the Mille Lacs County, the sheriff would come and burn down our homesteads. We had a big burnout in nine, uh, 1911 and 1920. And even to this day, that our county, Mille Lacs County, is talking about that our reservation doesn't exist. But there are legal documents across the years that 
that state something different about the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe and other reservations as well across the whole United States. And so my question is, what will be your commitment to making sure that our homelands are always protected from that legal standing and also from something that's even more important. It is the way the people feel about the land. When we talk about our land and we go into the lakes, the woods, wherever we go in our area, and we know the land knows us because that's where we are from and our ancestors and we've been there for generations and generations. So my my biggest goal is to make sure that our ha homelands are always protected and recognized legally. So Melanie, for 500 years, virtually no native treaties have been respected. We all know that. And it absolutely can't go on. It has to be that those treaties are specifically respected and people will always want to break them out of greed to want to take away something. And it, can't ha we, it just has to stop. And I think the other thing that's important to say, look, I was talking about environmental justice. But I think it's important for everybody around the country to recognize that Native Americans have had an attitude towards the land and the environment and their surroundings that has been deep and spiritual and important. And is different and is a, an attitude of leadership incredibly important leadership at a time of climate crisis. And I think it's important that we recognize not just that there's been this injustice, but also that natives have been right. That in fact, that attitude is an attitude that everybody has to have. But in terms of the treaties, really, it's, it's heartbreaking to go back and see what's happened because one after, you know, virtually every treaty has been broken and no more treaties can be broken. I mean, I promise you, I, I, it, it's been definitely horribly unjust and unfair, and it just has to stop. Thank you very much. Miigwech. Good afternoon. Huma. My name is Stacy Montooth. I'm a citizen of the Walker River Paiute Nation. I am the granddaughter of Margaret Osagera, and I am a direct descendant a seventh generation descendant of Cipriano, the first signer of the Freedy of Tremont. That is the first legally binding document to protect the beautiful lands of Yosemite Valley. Wow, wow. <laughs> I think that this is such a huge opportunity to speak to you. I want to make sure that you know I'm going to take a look at my notes. I don't want to mistake and not ask you this question completely. Like all 574 tribal nations in what is now the United States, we are grounded in our culture and united by our connection to Mother Earth. Today, our homelands, the beautiful, vast Great Basin, actually the great state of Nevada, the Naval Air Station of Fallon is not just looking to reauthorize use of over 200,000 acres, which covers five county areas, and this includes airspace, land ranges, and electric systems, and this would be used primarily for air and ground training activities. But the United States military, in addition, is requesting to take over another 670,000 acres. This withdrawal is in addition to another request to expand the Nellis Air Force Base. That's just down the road from where we are. That would mean that 1% of our indigenous lands, the great state of Nevada, would be controlled by the US military. Further, if you don't know, please allow me to remind you, there is no other ethnicity in this country that volunteers for the US military services in greater numbers than Native Americans. From the Revolutionary War to the current Middle East conflicts, our ancestors and our relatives, they always answer the call to duty. 
Knowing our people's commitment to safeguard America, if elected president, how would you ensure that our tribal nation's cultural resources, specifically our sacred sites, the final resting places of our ancestors, of our loved ones, our traditional hunting and fishing grounds, the places where we pray, how can you ensure that they're protected and at the very, very least, that our tribal nations are compensated accordingly? So let, let me say this. Sovereignty over those lands is something that you have by right. The idea, I mean, I know the story also of Yucca Mountain, that that is a sacred place for Paiute people. And I know that there has been, every time, there has been a desire to take over native lands regardless of rights or sovereignty or law. People have gone about it aggressively, recklessly, and unfairly. And I think that that just can't go on. What you're talking about, about turning over hundreds of thousands more acres to the U.S. military because they want it, mm -hmm. is not something that I would support. So I want it to be clear. Look, as a country, we're in a crisis about who we are, in my opinion. And the climate crisis is the most obvious way of seeing it because it's threatening us and we have to move to a different way of thinking. But actually, how we envision ourselves in the world from a military standpoint, whether in fact we think that we're the world's policemen and you know that we're going to rule the world with our military might as opposed to lead the world in a variety of ways, including especially morality, we are in a crisis. And what you're talking to me about, as far as I'm concerned, is are we going to go back to being a value-driven, spiritually healthy country that recognizes the rights of human beings and our need to exist safely and spiritually on the earth? And I think that, you know, there's no way to look at a country where we have declining life expectancy three years in a, in a row, where three of the big four issues causing it are alcoholism, drug abuse, and suicide, and not see we need to start thinking about things differently. That we need to re, you know, I say we need to rebuild America for, in a sustainable way. We need to reinvent again who we are and to be a value-driven country that stands for things. And that's the question you're asking me. And I think it's at the heart of this campaign is at the heart of what we need to do in this country. Tom, I'm, my name is Judith LeBlanc, and I'm the director of the Native Organizers Alliance and uh, a member of the Caddo Nation of Oklahoma. And I'm, I'm really uh, happy about the opportunity to be in conversation with you, but to give you a an inside peek on Indian country, I'm, I'm just as happy to be on a panel with an Indian who has a New York accent, considering I packed my car in Harvard Yan, and I have a terrible accent. That you think Lance has a New York accent? <laughs> <laughs> and I live in New York, so I face the oppression of the New York accents. So, uh, Native Organizers Alliance, we've been working for the last three years since Trump was elected with uh, tribal uh, leaders in South Dakota, traditional societies, native community groups, and farmers and ranchers to, to hopefully prevent damage to the Missouri River and the aquifer in South Dakota. A and we've also been working with 350, a very important ally. So my question to you, because this is not unusual in Indian country, we have the Back 40 mine in northern Wisconsin. We have the closing of coal plant mines on Navajo. Uh, we have the water that's, uh, and the land here in Nevada that the mining companies took the money and ran and never, and never uh, did any repair work to the environment. So what would you do as president 
in order to facilitate a uh, transition from dependence on fossil fuel to one of alternative energy, specifically what would you do to enhance tribal sovereignty and tribal economies? So Judith, one of the parts of my justice-based climate plan means going to the wide open spaces of America, specifically including reservations. And we know that we can't just stop burning fossil fuels. We also know that we have to rebuild the country. And that's going to mean a lot of specific jobs in terms of rebuilding roads, rebuilding bridges, rebuilding the electrical grid, rebuilding buildings so that they're energy efficient. But specifically in rural America, we're going to have to, quote unquote, sequester carbon. And what does that mean? That means planting things. And we're going to have to go to the people who live there, who understand how to do that, where to do that, and partner with them and ask them how to do that, and then pay them money for providing a service to the country and the world. And so a big part of, of my justice-based climate plan is going to be partnering with people in the wide open spaces, specifically including Native Americans on reservations, to, to make sure that what we're doing in terms of growing things and planting things makes sense in their mind, to make sure that they're part of the solution and that they're paid for doing that. So I have a whole rural plan about how, that would be very, very relevant for the reservation. But in terms of specifically the climate plan, there would be a massive job program about rebuilding the United States of America in a sustainable fashion. And particularly in rural America, beyond that job program, which would be literally millions of good paying union jobs, there would be a partnership to actually use the wide open spaces to sequester carbon to help save the world but to pay people for doing it. And as one follow-up question, we, all over Indian country, there are initiatives that are solving, are seeking to solve problems by relying on traditional practices. And one of the big problems we face in Indian country is that we're very under-resourced when it comes to developing a pathway to regenerative tribal economic development. What do you think your administration would do, be it to recover from dependency on fossil fuel or, or just overcoming generational unemployment? Judith, this is obviously an absolutely critical question because I know the unemployment rates and I know the income rates and I know how destructive a, a pattern that is. So I look at the, my, I have a completely different idea than this president about what is prosperity and what creates prosperity. He thinks that you create prosperity by cutting taxes for the richest Americans and the biggest corporations. I think we create prosperity by investing in the American people. So when I talk about academics, when I talk about schools, when I talk about teachers, when I talk about young people, to me that's creating prosperity. I believe we're going to have the biggest job program in the history of the country in terms of rebuilding America, and that specifically has to include Indian country. I believe that we connect, can connect rural America and urban America through broadband everywhere to make sure, that, and also rebuilding roads, that connectivity is critical for people to be able to be hooked into the, the fastest growing parts of America and the American economy. But beyond that, I believe that investing in young people and their opportunities and their talents is how you actually create prosperity. And that's something that I think has got to be equalized around the country. Because the, we are very unequal in the money we spend for kids because most of the money we spend is based on local property taxes, so rich kids get more money than poor kids. And that just can't be true in a country that's supposed to be about justice and equality. And I would make that an absolutely critical part of what we do. And I think that it's also critical in terms of mobility, the ability of kids to succeed who are from low-income families. That it, 
it can't be America if the American dream doesn't exist. And if we're not doing it explicitly, if we're not taking race into account and history into account, that's why I said, I believe just policy comes out of true narrative. And so what you're talking about to me in Indian country is something that is true specifically there, but it's true across this country in a huge way and which is really where I think we, that, that's my idea of prosperity, is broad-based shared prosperity based on the success of the American people. Thank you for coming. My name is Donna Siemens. I am the grassroots organizer for Four Directions, daughter of the co-executive director is Barb and O.J. Siemens. Um, I'm from the Rosebud Sioux Tribe in South Dakota. And my question is, uh, when it comes to protecting Native American voting rights, as president, how would you do that? So obviously, we have a Republican Party that is doing everything it can to take away voting rights from American citizens including specifically Native Americans. And I, I'm aware of the, what they've done specifically about the idea of forcing people to have street addresses if they're gonna be registered, that that's a specific attack on the rights of Native Americans to vote. I don't consider it unusual, I do consider it criminal. You know, from my mind, taking away the basic right of citizenship from American citizens conspiring to do it, doing it over and over is something that I find. Look, I'm a grassroots person. I believe in democracy. I believe in the broadest possible democracy, the most inclusive possible democracy. And anyone who conspires to break that and conspires to cheat an election and take away the vote and the voice of Americans, particularly people who've been discriminated against for centuries, crushes me. I don't even think it's against the law. I think it's against something higher than the law. We have laws, but there's something higher than the law, which you know we're really talking about the spirit and meaning of being an American and of the country itself. And that goes right to the heart of it. So wh how I feel about this, you, th it doesn't, I mean, I can't even talk about it. It's so wrong. And so how much am I willing to do to fight back against it? just about anything legal. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. We're almost there. Could you give a <laughs> big Come on, round, okay. round of applause for the panel and Mr. Steyer. And so with that, we will conclude this panel. Um, can, can I answer? Well, I want to answer one question that sure. wasn't asked. And it was in the, people brought it up beforehand. I just, Mr. Uh, Councilman Pollock has to catch a plane. <coughs> so there was a, your question? do you have a last question, Mark? I, I, I wanted to talk about wounded knee for one second. Look, there's been a question. See you in Thank you. Appreciate it. Look, in, in my, I know there's been a question and it was, I was thinking about it before we got, came out here about the 20 medals of honor given to the 7th Cavalry for a wounded knee. And people have wondered, you know, if those should be rescinded. And, and let me say this, of course they should be rescinded. This is one of the great tragic moments in American history where we went, where the country and the army went so wrong in such a profound way. And I'm talking about telling the true narrative so we can have the just policy. And if there's anything more obvious in American history that the true narrative includes retelling what Wounded Knee was about and the idea that soldiers could be given a medal of honor for what happened at Wounded Knee has got to be changed. It's not a question of whether it should be changed, it's whether it has to be changed. Because I don't know how we can claim to be a just nation 
if we're not telling the truth about what happened in 1890 and why it happened and why it could never, ever result in anything that had the word honor in it. Tom, I have one, one quick question for you. Um, and it's a very uh, serious issue to my community in particular. Um, you know where we live in the Hamptons. And it has to do with sacred sites and the protection of sacred sites. Um, yesterday, we had over 100 protesters uh, at a sacred site that dates all the way back to the 1600s in our community. And one of the issues right now across the country, not just in my community, is the protection of sacred sites. And I just you know, want to get some feedback from you on how you would deal with that, because NAGPRA doesn't cover everything. NAGPRA doesn't cover um, private lands. And a lot of the Hamptonites- Is that right? Yeah, it does not cover private lands. So again, you, we run into these problems where there's laws, but the laws don't cover the necessary um, things that need to happen to when you have private lands. A homeowner has land, they, they go to build a home, they dig up bones, and that just happened to our community. And so I just want to know where you would stand on that. Well, I think these are going to, I'd have to look at the specific things, Lance. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a question here, and I was dealing with it earlier, really talking to Judith, about where we are spiritually in this country and where we let people be spiritually in this country. And there's really a question here about what we value and how we value other people and actually how we are going to rebuild ourselves as a value-driven, moral country trying to be part of what I would think of as the positive life force in the universe. And so I don't have the specifics and I'd have to make sure, you know, it's, yeah, it, you know God is in the details, mm -hmm. but recognizing where we are as a country and getting back to the idea that actually there are deep spiritual things that are imp the, really what drive people and that we have been ignoring them to a gigantic extent and that really this president is almost the embodiment of the idea that money and rich people and low taxes for the richest people and the biggest corporations is what makes America great. And that's absolutely not true. That we, if we get away really from where our heart is, nowhere in the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence to say we need the biggest GDP per capita and we should make sure we take care of the richest people in the country. You're talking about spiritual values, about freedom, about justice, equality. We really are going to have to get back to the idea that this is a country that stands for much more than taking care of rich people and making sure they're costed and get to go to. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, well, I, I actually have the privilege to be, to say that I have just been told by the next president that he still wants to keep on talking. So, <laughs> <laughs> so with that, sir, I would like to give you an opportunity to do a closing to address the people and the panel, and uh, okay. then, then we can stop. So let me say this. I am basically, I've been traveling around the country for seven years full time as an organizer. And I've gone all over this country. I've had town halls in red states and blue states and purple states. And I've tried to talk to as many people as I possibly can to understand where they're coming from and what their reality looks like. And let me say this, what I am seeing in the United States and what I'm hearing today, we tend to talk a lot about complicated policies and okay. economic ideas and political science idea. I don't think this is complicated at all. I view what's going on in the United States as this government being cruel to American citizens. Literally cruel to Americans practically from the day they're born. And when you think about rural health care and the ability of women in rural settings to access childbirth support, it actually, it's cruelty before a kid's even born. And it goes right up till the day you die. And so 
I view this election, I'm saying there's a broken government that isn't serving the American people, and that's true, and that I want to break this corporate stranglehold on our government, and that's true. But what's really going on is the Republican Party is cruel to Americans for money. They want to cut taxes on rich people. They've done it. They want to cut taxes on the biggest corporations. They've done it. And what that means is they don't want to help people. And if people are going to get sick and die, that's, their attitude is that's just the way it goes. And if kids aren't going to get a chance to get educated, that's just the way it goes. And if seniors can't afford to eat or can't afford their meds, that's just the way it goes. I have a very simple point. I feel exactly the opposite way. I view, I was trying to say this last night on, at the debates. I view the American people, specifically including Native Americans, as my team, and I'm 100% in for my team. I played sports my whole life, team sports, and I cannot abide someone running down the field and kicking my teammate in the face, and I see it every day. And it's not going to happen. So I'm asking you for your support because I will do every single thing to turn around what I believe is the systematic cruelty that this government is showing towards Americans, the systematic racism that they show, and really a failed 40-year experiment by a radical right-wing Republican Party to be cruel to Americans on behalf of corporations and rich people. It's got to end. It's got to end in 2020. We actually have to save this country and we have to save the world at the same time. And I promise you, I will give every single thing I can do to make that happen. And I need your support to do it. All right, thank you. So let's give them one more round of applause and uh, we can let them go to the background.